Hello everybody and welcome into episode number 226 of the Bible 2021 podcast. We are reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11 today and our focus is on why is the Lord's Supper dangerous? Well, every day we dig into God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Every day we seek to ask a question of the Word of God and answer it from the Word of God. Our goal, our our reason for existence is to get as many people as possible in daily Bible listening, daily Bible reading, and we would encourage you to share the show with friends and neighbors and family members, and the best way to do that is is at our website, Bible2021.com, Bible2021.com. You can share individual episodes there. There's a way to subscribe to the show there on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. And every episode has a full transcript. Perez Uzza. I'll say it again. Perez Uzza. Now that place name from the Old Testament sends chills down my spine because it commemorates the place where a man named Uzza unthinkingly reached out to steady the Ark of the Covenant and he was instantly killed for touching that something that is utterly holy. Now this happened in the Old Testament, of course, and Perez Uzza means outbreak against Uzza. Many people would assume that that sort of thing only happens in the Old Testament, but honestly, that'd be pretty far from the truth. For instance, in the book of Acts, we find both Ananias and his wife dropping dead when they told the lie to the church leadership in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then we have today's chapter, which in some ways is a little bit unnerving, and I think it should be unnerving, intentionally so. So consider these verses from uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. And look, friends, when you understand that fallen asleep uh, is a metaphor here, and it's a metaphor used to indicate death, then you understand how serious Paul is being here when he says that many of the people in the church at the time have died for mishandling communion. That's pretty scary. So the New Testament is telling us here that if we partake of communion in an improper way on Sunday morning, then we are running the risk of sickness, weakness, or even death. And when I first read that in the Bible many years ago, I was shocked. And I was especially shocked because... uh I had never heard preachers talking about that before. I hadn't been warned about such a thing. Now, it's very possible that happened when I was a kid and I wasn't paying attention, but uh, it surprised me to learn that communion is such a serious matter. Uh, But we should know that it is at the very center of Christian practice of all the centuries of the church. And I honestly believe it's only been in the last couple of hundred years when The modern church has begun taking communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, however you want to call it, far too lightly and probably partaking of it far too infrequently in most churches. So communion is not merely a quarterly snack of crackers and juice that the church sometimes does. Rather, it is intended to be a life-giving, gospel-proclaiming, faith-building, thankful heart-producing, Christ-focusing act that causes us to remember and proclaim that central truth of Christianity that the body of Jesus was broken instead of ours for sin, and the blood of Jesus was violently spilled out instead of ours for our sin. When we eat and drink the bread, and the fruit of the vine, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection and his soon return together. So how can something like that be dangerous? Well, I believe the answer to that question lies in the very importance of the act itself. Though some churches treat it as such, communion is no light matter or peripheral sort of issue. Listen to what Paul says about communion in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. In giving this instruction, I don't praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. 
Verse 20, when you come together then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for at the meal each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What what should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this matter, says Paul. So it would appear that the central trouble to communion in the Corinthian church was directly related to disunity. Something was causing disunity, a lack of unity so profound that Paul is suggesting that they would be better off to not have church on Sunday. That's a big deal. So what was the exact nature of this disunity? Well, apparently people were selfishly seeking to eat and drink and not allowing the whole church to eat and drink. Some were overeating. Some were even getting drunk, which does tell you the communion wine apparently contained alcohol, while others were going hungry and thirsty. And that tells us that communion was not a tiny little snack in the early church with a symbolic little wafer of bread. It tells us it was a real meal. And when we read in verse 33 and 34 that it says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. We see that the purpose of communion was not necessarily to eat a full meal, even though that's probably what they were doing, in terms of like uh, a covered dish or a, a festival or a feast together. It was more of an act of worship and remembrance. The food wasn't the focus, but the body and the blood of Jesus was the focus. But some people were taking the opportunity to pick out, so to speak, and in doing so were being unwelcoming. They were being rude, inhospitable, and putting themselves first by being downright selfish. And that kind of pride and selfishness that characterized some of the Corinthians' practice of eating and drinking all of the food before others could even begin to eat, that sort of seems, I don't know, innocuous to us, not very serious. Uh, like, you know, a minor sort of sin, like rudeness more than a sin. But it was a kind of selfishness that was deadly serious. And when I say deadly serious, I'm being literal. It was deadly serious to the Lord. Because there's a the thing, and again, this is not minor. This is major. There is no place in the body of Christ for a me first kind of selfishness. And that gets us to the antidote and proper approach to communion, which we see in verses 27 through 29. Paul says, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Well, what does that mean? Before communion happens, we must examine ourselves and reflect on the rest of the church, considering our place in the body of Christ. As members of the church, or using the metaphor Paul uses, as parts of the body, we're no more or less important than anybody else. Say it again. We are no more or less important than anybody else. We are called to honor others above ourselves, and we are called to put their needs ahead of our own. And, maybe good news, they must do the same for us. And when we are doing that together in unison, we become the beautiful, radiant, sweet-smelling, attractive body of Christ, lovingly caring for each other in a kind of unity that proclaims the gospel of Jesus to a lost and dying world. And when we're not, when we're selfish, when we have a me first attitude, when we eat not waiting on other people and do that sort of thing, that kind of selfishness is literally deadly and we must avoid it. Well, let's read our chapter and then we'll close with our verses of the month. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold fast to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman and God is the head of Christ. Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head dishonors his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman doesn't cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, 
let her head be covered. A man should not cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. So too woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman and all things come from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to argue about this, we have no other custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. Indeed, it is necessary that there be factions among you, so that those who are approved may be recognized among you. When you come together, then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, For at the meal, each one eats his own supper, so one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup, for whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, Welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. And I will give instructions about the other matters when I come. Amen. Well, let's close with our Bible memory verses for the month of August from 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Amen. Good day to you, friends, and Godspeed.